Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce today our speaker, our guest speaker, Alistair Gornal, who holds a BA and a MA in the study of religions from SOAS. And he gained his PhD in South Asian studies from the University of Cambridge in 2013. He is currently assistant professor in the humanities at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, where he teaches courses on Asian philosophy, literature, science and religion. He is also a research associate in the Department of Languages and Cultures of South Asia at SOAS, the University of London, and he's a 2018 research fellow at the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation. Alistair's research focuses on the intellectual and cultural history of Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia. Today, Alistair Gornoy is going to talk about his first book, which is the result of over 10 years of research. It is called Rewriting Buddhism. Pali Literature and Monastic Reform in Sri Lanka, 1157 to 1270. It is published on Open Accent, Open Access by the UCL Press uh, in London, and you can see the link in the chat if you wish to download it. Uh, Alistair and I, we are good friends actually. We met in, in Cambridge back in 2011, if I'm not wrong. We, we were working on similar uh, PhDs, which were similar in, in topic, he was working on the grammatical tradition of Sri Lanka and I was working on the grammatical tradition in, in Burma. And just to finish this introduction, I remember that once we were discussing about the, the outcome of our uh, respective research and he told me very seriously that uh, his mission was to restore the position of Mogalana, the grammarian, in the history of Pali literature. So I think he has done that and more things in his, in his recent book. And it is a great privilege and an honor to have him uh, with us here. So, Alistair, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Alesh, um, for that very kind and, and rather undeserved introduction. Um, I'm just going to try and share my presentation. So hopefully this works. Can everyone see that? <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, you can see. OK. Yes. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon and good morning everyone. Um, my talk today is essentially a descriptive overview of my recently published book, Rewriting Buddhism. Um, for those who want to see the analysis behind what I'm going to say today, uh, you can go to uclpress.com forward slash Buddhism to download a free copy of the book. The title of the talk and subtitle of the book is Pali Literature and Monastic Reform 1157 to 1270. Now, when we speak of Pali literature, many will think only of the Tipitaka or Pali Canon, as it is often referred to in Western academic writings. And yet for almost 2000 years, the monastic community has continued to use Pali as a privileged language for commenting and elaborating on the Buddha's doctrine, the Dhamma. One of the most significant periods in Pali literary history occurred in Sri Lanka between 1157 and 1270. To give an estimate, it is likely that out of all the known Pali works composed in Sri Lanka and South India, more than a third were composed during this long century. The number of works preserved from this era attests not only to the relative magnitude of literary production, but also to the fact that these texts have long been preserved as key authorities for the Theravada tradition throughout Southern Asia. I refer to this long century as Sri Lanka's reform era, since the period was marked by three important monastic reforms held in 1165, 1232 and 1266 during the reigns of Parakramabahu I, Vijayabahu III and Parakramabahu II respectively. These reforms responded to an age of political upheaval and perceived religious decline and involved the royal purification and unification of the Sangha, which before 1165 was divided into three fraternities, the Mahavihara, Abhayagiri Vihara and Jetavana Vihara. The idea of a reform era does not mean, however, that the reforms began or ended with the reigns of these three kings. Rather, the process of reform had begun long before the Council of 1165, and continued even during times of minimal royal intervention, patronage and protection, in particular 
this era in between the reigns of Parakrambahu I and Parakrambahu II, which is known in the Chulavangsa as the age of 16 kings. So I've added Mahinda VI in there as well, who's not mentioned in the Chulavangsa, but he only reigned for five days. So. My book is an intellectual history of this important cultural moment in Sri Lanka's pre-modern past. It describes the broad changes in the reform era Sangha's religious outlook as expressed primarily in the Pali literature composed during the period and in the role played by these works in facilitating the reform process. I argue that the intensive production of Pali literature composed during this era was largely a consequence of the Sangha's growing organizational power and that scholar monks composed works in Pali, in particular philological works, commentaries, anthologies and poems as a means of framing the chaotic circumstances of their time within an ordered conceptual and emotional space through which they could navigate their changing social and political conditions. Mm -hmm. Pali then was not only the sacred language of the Sangha's inherited religious tradition, its imaginaire, but rather also a language of reform and transformation, that is of social and cultural life. In the first part of the book, Chaos, I questioned the long-standing idea that this era of literary activity was solely a byproduct of the political stability of Parakramabahu I's reign, Sri Lanka's so-called Augustan age. Rather, I argue that scholar monks composed new Pali texts in the reform era as a creative response to perceived religious decline, and that it was equally the upending of traditional order in the centuries either side of Parakramabahu's rule that helped set the stage for the unprecedented literary activities of the period. The 10th and 11th centuries, for instance, saw South Indian Chola kings rule Sri Lanka and move the administrative capital to Polonaruva. This decimated Anuradhapura's economy and left the old capital as little more than a ceremonial site. The old monastic order in the city was hollowed out and alternative monastic power centers arose around Polonaruva, in particular at the hilltop monastery of Dimbalagala, photographed here. In the face of the Chola threat, kings of Lanka for the first time also sought marriage alliances with the Kalingas here and the Pandyas. This led to a fragmentation of the traditional royal family, bitter wars of succession either side of Parakrambahu I's reign, and importantly, to a greater monastic involvement in court politics. The absorption of the island into the continental political sphere was also mirrored culturally in the adoption of new Sanskrit textual forms, both by the royal court and monastic elites. Faced with an apparent existential threat, the old sectarian order of Anuradhapura had begun to fall away. And with the support of Parakramabahu I, some elite monks decided to unify under the banner of the Mahavihara, leading to the active dissolution of the Abhayagiri and Jetavana fraternities. This process culminated in Parakramabahu's Reform Council of 1165, where the Sangha was officially purified and unified. The 1165 reforms and those that followed are often cited as evidence that the Sangha had been subsumed within the state, creating a form of imperial Buddhism. And yet a defining feature of the reform era is also the Sangha's organizational power and potential autonomy. It developed a hierarchy modeled on a royal court led by a king-like figure, the Mahasami, Grand Master, with its own administrative structure. And in the 50 years after Parakramabahu I's reign, during a civil war that witnessed 16 kings and queens, its leadership remained entirely stable. One would have thought, based on the, only on the imperial model, that a Sangha left rudderless without a dependable monarch would have similarly fragmented. And yet its newfound organization and unity meant that it could withstand such political chaos. Unlike the hierarchy of the royal court, which of course was kinship based, the Sangha's administrative structure was founded largely on one's level of education 
although kinship ties did play a role. And it is partly in the context of the increasingly formal educational system during the reform era that we can understand the intensity of literary activity. New texts, in particular Pali handbooks and handbook commentaries, sifted and sorted the doctrine and discipline, sometimes experimenting with new pedagogical techniques from the Sanskrit tradition in order to unify Buddhist thought and practice and disseminate it within the reformed Sangha. While monks largely studied vernacular texts at the beginning of their monastic careers, it was a monk's level of training in Pali texts that determined his social position in the monastic community. Pali literature then served both as an organizational plane in which the religious thought of the reformed Sangha could be ordered, and at the same time as an educational domain in which monastic social hierarchies could be reproduced. That the reforms should be regarded also as a process rather than simply as royally sponsored events is reflected in the fact that almost half of the Pali texts produced during the reform era were actually composed amidst the civil wars after Parakram Bahu I's reign, but with, a but with a reform agenda still firmly in mind. It seems that the rapid fragmentation of power on the island, while viewed negatively by the monks themselves, may not actually have been as harmful to Buddhist literary culture as imagined. In fact, the formation of multiple centers of power produced multiple sources of support, in particular among warlords and other petty nobles. And it is a testament to the acumen of the monastic elites that they quickly adapted to the local and personal politics of the age. It is in this context, for instance, that we see most clearly the monastic community's continuing role as a political actor, with scholar monks composing literary works in part as a means of shaping the sensibilities of the new nobility in their favor. In the space of a few decades then, the process of reform involved periods in which the royal court was closely involved in monastic affairs as well as years of political instability where monastic elites had to function without any long-term reliable source of central patronage. In many ways, the very fact that the degree of royal involvement in monastic reform fluctuated during the period reveals that royal supervision was not a constant factor or at least a necessary condition for the production of literature in aid of the reforms. Rather, what was common to both periods of stability and turmoil was the newly centralized hierarchical structure of the Sangha itself. It was this organizational power that best explains how the Sangha maintained its unity and continued the process of reform during the chaos of the period. The second part of the book focuses in more detail on how scholar monks adopted new textual practices to bring conceptual order to the monastic community and its scriptural tradition. These monks generally understood the political chaos of the reform era in the context of traditional predictions about the precipitous deterioration of the Dhamma, the idea that the Buddha's Dhamma would last 5,000 years. They composed new works of Pali grammar, experimented with more systematic forms of commentary, and also for the first time started to produce anthologies of Pali literature in the belief that by better preserving the Dhamma, they could stem this decline and reverse their social and political misfortunes. This belief was based on the real connection between monastic unity and the standardization of the doctrine and discipline, as well as a more idealized connection in which the Pali literary activity was thought to play an apotropaic role in forestalling the disappearance of the religion. As the acknowledged access discipline for scriptural study, grammar in particular played a pivotal role as the first line of defense against the degeneration of Buddhism. In seeking to explain their age of chaos, scholar monks blamed their older philological practices and sought out new models of grammatical order. In an unprecedented intellectual feat, they abandoned their old Kachayana grammatical tradition much like they abandoned the old sacred capital of Anuradhapura and started anew with a different system of rules, the Moggallana Vyakarana, that would form the basis of grammatical scholarship in Sri Lanka in the centuries to come. <laughs> 
The framework for this new grammatical system was found in the Sanskrit texts that had become available due to intensified contact with monastic centers in Northeast India. The grammarians of the era approached their sacred language in an increasingly analytical rather than exegetical way, taking a particular interest in the metaphysical order of Pali's deep semantic structures. The result was an improved system of grammar that was not only focused on understanding scripture, but also on est establishing linguistic order at a fundamental level. The commentaries produced during the reform era share many of the same intellectual concerns as the grammatical works. Commentators speak of recovering the essential meaning, the sarata of their scriptures, which they thought had been obscured by previous commentarial practices. And they experimented with new exegetical forms in the belief that they could better extract this meaning from the works they were commenting on. In the handbook commentarial tradition in particular, we find increasingly systematic forms of exegesis based on an innovative application of commentarial models that had likely cir uh, first circulated in the Sanskrit tradition. This new formalism also responded to the practical pedagogical needs of the late medieval school system, which had come to form the basis of the Sangha's courtly hierarchy. These formal developments were accompanied too by a reappraisal of the nature of scripture and the authority of commentaries. Scholar monks began to think of the Dhamma primarily as a conceptual or semantic entity, analytically separable from the wording of Pali texts. And they sometimes speak of canonical commentaries and sub-commentaries too as teachings of the Buddha, insofar as they were thought to form part of scripture's meaning. The scholastic focus of scholar monks during the reform era gave new importance to handbooks as well. And these works were sometimes regarded as commentaries in that they preserved and condensed the meaning of scripture even though they did not comment on the wording of a particular canonical texts. Many of the handbooks composed during the period, however, differ from earlier condensations in that they can be defined more precisely as anthologies. That is, they weave together passages from the canon and its commentaries in a new work, often with the exegetical aim, again, of preserving the essential meaning the saratta of their scriptural tradition in both its totality and compact utility. The reform era anthologies develop new techniques of compilation to curate this essence, including contents lists, detailed referencing, and forms of bibliography. This new practice of compilation facilitated the wide dissemination of the reform sangha's doctrinal and disciplinary concerns and also allowed scholar monks to align their tradition with religious practices suited to their tumultuous times, in particular devotional merit-making and the pursuit of heavenly rebirths and Buddhahood instead of Nirvana. On the face of it, there's something almost paradoxical in how scholar monks experimented with Pali during the period. For on the one hand, the concern for social and textual order and the exigencies of the reform process meant that Pali grammars, commentaries, and handbooks were increasingly systematic in their. Yet at the same time, the very ability of scholar monks to move beyond traditional philological forms was accompanied by more abstract and less formal notions of scriptural language and scriptural authority. The palpable concern among scholar monks of the reform era about the decline of the Dhamma also shifted their attention to more imminent religious goals, transforming their lives within Sangsara rather than, rather than escaping it, since transcendence was perceived to be increasingly difficult to achieve. The attention of elites thus turned to enhancing the accrual of merit through devotional practices, in particular the cultivation of favorable emotions and the strengthening of communal ties in the worship of the Buddha and his relics. In part three of the book, I explore how new forms of Pali literature, in particular devotional Buddha biographies and relic histories, played an important role in enhancing and controlling this emotionally charged soteriology. <clears throat> 
In writing these works, monks disregarded centuries of skepticism about the moral value of ornate poetry and relied on models of Sanskrit court literature as a resource for their aesthetic ends. This tradition of Sanskrit court poetry or kavya was not seamlessly compatible with monastic literary culture, however. And we can see in the new literary and devotional works of the reform era, a conscious reconceptualization of literary eloquence as a virtue suited to monastic goals. One scholar, Sangharakita, composed a treatise on Pali poetics in which he centers his literary theory around notions of morality, civility, and propriety. He argued that a knowledge of worldly propriety was the essence of composing and appreciating good poetry and thus managed to present ornate devotional poetry to his skeptical audience as not only an acceptable object of study, but one that is essential for the cultivation of virtue. He is careful, however, to emphasize that devotional poetry is not a means of liberation, but only a way of cultivating noble sentiments that can bring about worldly karmic benefits. Devotional practices in the reform era centered on the worship of Buddha relics. And it is no coincidence then that a large part of, a re of reform era Pali poetry comprises devotional histories of the different Buddha relics found in Sri Lanka. This literature was as much about personal karmic development as it was about social and political transformation. And many of these works in both their courtly style and substance presuppose an audience of monastic and lay elites. A scholar monk, Dhammakitti, for instance, composed his Dartavangsa, History of the Tooth, in part to instill devotional sentiments in a young Pandyan prince who was being groomed for the throne during Queen Lilavati's third reign in 1211. Dhammakitti describes the tooth relic's karmic connection with the Pandyan royal house and uses ornamental language to embellish tales of the tooth relic's miracles and transformative powers in particular in the conversion of kings and ministers. These poems offer a devotional path where feelings of aesthetic pleasure towards a relic result in devotees performing wondrous acts of generosity that in turn allow them to obtain longer lives and heavenly rebirths. It is in the rhetorical power of such reform era poems that we see most clearly the inapplicability of a distinction between devotion and politics. For aesthetic emotions served as important vehicles for shaping social relationships and maintaining hierarchies in the midst of the era's changing political landscape. It is noteworthy in this regard that the ideal devotional and social order that emerges from much of this literature often presents the Buddha as the ultimate sovereign of the island with temporal and spiritual rights superior to the nobility. While idealized, this devotional social order likely reflects the reality that monastic elites had become significant landowners and power holders by the reform era, and that relations with the court and nobility had become increasingly hierarchical due to competition over shared social terrain. There was a palpable desire on behalf of the leaders of the Sangha then that the imagined lordship of the Buddha, as engendered in particular in the literary and ritual representations of his relics, should translate into real monastic power and prosperity. The intimate connection between devotional sentiment and social order is reflected also in the Buddha biographies of the period. One of the most ornate poems of the reform era, Bhagat Buddha Rakita's Jinalankara, Ornaments of the Buddha, was composed in part for an increasing number of monastic and lay elites who aspired to Buddhahood rather than Nirvana. Contrary to previous views connecting the rise of the Bodhisattva ideal with a supposed popular desire for a charismatic savior, the dominant tone in the work is rather of subordinating those who aspire to Buddhahood as tributary supplicants to the historical Buddha, while sanctifying the Bodhisattva life as a model of worldly perfection. Buddha Rakita thus subsumes bodhisattvas into a traditional devotional framework that is necessarily hierarchical in placing the Buddha, his relics and monastic elites as the appropriate recipients of the devotional offerings of bodhisattva practice. This latter point is emphasized at the end of the poem 
where Buddha Rakita has his audience imagine themselves offering the world's wealth to the historical Buddha, who is depicted as having a proprietary right over everything in the universe. The poem's commentary states clearly that the world is the Buddha's legal property, his Santaka. While grammars, commentaries and handbooks then used new exegetical practices to extract and protect the essence of scriptural tradition and to establish a coherent conceptual order that helped unify the monastic community. Reform era Pali poetry was a complementary karmic practice that utilized Sanskrit literary models and theories in order to better cultivate favorable sentiments among the nobility within an aestheticized and hierarchical social order. To conclude, my book argues that the unprecedented cultural product productivity of the reform era was not simply a byproduct of political stability, as has often been thought. Rather, it was also rooted in chaos, the destruction of the old social order and the birth of a more fragmented political environment. The monastic community emerged from this era with more organizational power than it had possessed in the previous centuries. Through the dual reform process of purification and unification, the Mahavihara carefully crafted a new coherent identity sustained within a matrix of Pali texts that provided a conceptual and emotional order within which monastic elites could think, act and shape their existing circumstances. The newfound unity of the reform era, however, was short lived. The Sangha's leadership began to fragment in the 14th and 15th centuries and rivalries emerged both within the monastic school system and between the senior monks of the forest and town traditions. Perhaps as a result, the composition of Pali texts uh, declined considerably and the Sangha turned much of its scholarly attention to composing works in Singhala. New life, however, was breathed into the Pali texts of the reform era in Southeast Asia due to the establishment of Sihala monastic lineages there from the late 12th century onwards. As a result of the political turmoil in Sri Lanka, some monks seem to have fled the island and established monastic lineages in what is now Myanmar and Thailand, taking with them copies of the important Pali works composed during the period. Some Burmese monks too likely came to Sri Lanka early in the reform era, though there is little strong evidence in the Pali and vernacular literature or in the inscriptional record that these monks contributed to the cultural and intellectual changes described. Contrary to common uh, perception, this early movement of monks across the Bay of Bengal was likely not part of some imperial mission to aid the state building enterprises of any particular king in Polonarua or Pagan. As a side note, um, we know that obviously later the, uh, the transmission of monks was part of imperial missions, but I'm, I'm just stressing that it wasn't the case uh, early um, in this 12th and 13th centuries in the relations between Sri Lanka and Burma. In the case of Sri Lanka, at least, it was largely political upheaval that led some ambitious monks to leave the island in search of better fortunes. While Sri Lanka's reform era helped usher in the trans-regional networks and intellectual exchanges characteristic of early modern Theravada Buddhism then, it did so rather serendipitously and not as the telos or goal of the reform process itself. Thank you, that's it. Thank you very much, um, Alistair. We're going to... Um...